pastors right now. So keep those in your prayers as well. All right. Up about that for now. Um, we are in our fourth installment of Understanding Grace. Today's message is uh, present your bodies to God or to Christ. This is a succession of what we've learned so far. Once we know our new identity and count it to be true and real, okay, we, our identity is in Jesus Christ. It's not found in my job. It's not found in my family name. It's not found in where I live or what political party I'm a part of, or even our church. Some people just like to go to the church that everyone knows, and that's where they identify. Our identity is not in even churches or politics or whatever. It's in Jesus Christ. Uh, you guys got to remember, when we get to heaven, there's going to be no denominational uh, buildings in heaven. We're just going to be one happy family in Jesus Christ. And so why not start seeing our true identity in him, our security to him? And the third thing we must do is offer our bodies to God, offer our bodies to Christ. We're going to start in Romans chapter 6, verse 13. We've been here before. It says this. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Now, this word yield, and I think of you, and if you read the email I sent out yesterday, I think of yield as a term we use when merging with traffic. Uh, we're supposed to yield. Um, to, to traffic that is already on the expressway. So we slow down. Some of us speed up to beat the car. Um, but yielding is a picture of us um, slowing down, uh, offering ourselves, as the, the Bible often translated, it's to offer oneself or present yourself. Paul uses it here in Romans 6.13 twice. He uses it two more times in verses 16 and 19. So I just want you to get this picture that as a child of God, we are to offer or present or yield our bodies to God. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present. Okay, again, this idea of yield your body, offer your body, present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy, acceptable unto God, which is your unreasonable service. Is that what it says? Reasonable service. This is just reasonable. What God has done for us, how he's made us new again, it just makes sense. It's proper, it's fitting, it's right. It's reasonable that we would present our bodies, yield our bodies to the Lord Almighty. Now, in our modern-day church, however, believers are pressured to commit their lives. You've been to services where you need to commit your life. You need to recommit your life. You need to dedicate your life. You need to rededicate your life. And Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, people are coming forward and getting on their knees and rededicating and rededicating and rededicating and recommitting and rededicating and recommitting. Consecrating their lives to God. Funny thing is, we never see that in any of the Pauline letters. Never once does Paul tell a born-again believer that they need to rededicate, reconsecrate, recommit their lives to Jesus Christ. We never see him say or use those terms. These are Man-made cliches. Somebody made them up at some point in time, and everyone said, sounds spiritual, sounds good. Let's make that happen in our church as well. But you will not find them in the New Testament scriptures. All this does is give the flesh. I'm not talking about your skin and bones. I'm talking about the old man's patterns that still exist in us, even though the old man, as we've learned already, is buried in the ground. All it does is give the flesh a good dose of pride. Remember, the flesh is all about doing things independently, doing things on their own, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, 
look what I'm doing for God. I'm going to go up and rededicate because I really mean it this time. I'm really going to be a good boy. I'm really going to be a good girl. I'm really going to read my Bible and pray and help old ladies across the street. That does something for our pride. Look at me. I went forward, rededicating my life, yet the flesh has nothing good to give. The flesh has never had anything good to give. God has never desired your flesh. He said, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Paul said, for I know that in me, in Romans 7, 18, that is in my flesh, get specific, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Can your flesh do anything good for God? The answer is no. Can your flesh try to do good? Absolutely. People do it every day. Christians even do it every day. I'm a good person. Working hard to be a good person. They're doing it in the flesh. It's of nothing to God. In fact, the Bible says it's sin. Anything done without faith is sin. What's the energy behind it? What's the motivation behind your goodwill, your good act, your good behavior? If it's the flesh, the flesh has never had anything good to give. And Paul spells it out here in verse 18 of Romans 7. So let's stick not with men's cliches, but with biblical terms. Let's not veer off because we get confused. Let's stick with biblical terms like yield and offer and present. They don't in fear that we can do something for God. You guys see that? If I just yield, I'm, here I am. I'm offering myself. I'm presenting myself. There's nothing I can do, but here I am, Lord. Use me. Let's stick to those terms. God just wants and needs our bodies to work through. Let's go back to Romans 6.13. Neither yield your members as instruments of righteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. God wants to manifest his life through us. That's his desire. It will always be his desire. He wants to manifest his life through you and through me. When you're young, when you're old, when you're middle-aged, that's what he wants. Flesh is deceptive. It's deceptive thinking. See, we think that by committing ourselves, what we do when we come up, we got invited, we came up, we bowed our head, and God, I'm serious about sin. Now I'm going to forsake sin. I'm not going to do it again. Really committing this time. Flesh is deceptive. Think that by committing ourselves to forsake sin and do God's will, we can please God. That's called the law. And we're free from the law. We got to understand the difference between law and grace because we can suck in the law real, real quick. Let's look at this. Here's the contrast. The law is what we do for God. Grace is what God does for us. I'm going to go up and recommit myself. And I'm going to really be serious about forsaking sin and doing God's will. Who's doing who for what? See, that's the law. I'm going to do this. And if I do this, God's going to be real pleased with me. Because it's all about my performance. It's all about what I'm going to do for him. We're no longer under the law. We're under grace. Anything we do today, it should be by his power. It's not our performance. It's his performance on the cross. His performance on the cross is 100%. He didn't miss anything. He did it perfectly. Don't get sucked up by the flesh to think that you can do something to make God love you more than he already does. Forget this unconditional love. We think, oh, there's something I could do to make God like me more. 
accept me more, appreciate me more, be proud of me more. God is proud with you and me when we put our total trust and dependency in Jesus Christ and say, Jesus, you do it. You live through me. I'm ready to partner with you in this life called Christianity. You may even go to other circles and they may have other clever and spiritual sounding words like, have you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? I know you got saved as a kid, but have you really surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? Maybe you've surrendered parts of your life to Jesus Christ, but maybe not all of it. Maybe uh, your heart has multiple rooms in it. And yes, you've allowed Jesus to walk through some of the doors in your heart. It sounds very spiritual. But I bet you there's some doors in your heart that you haven't quite opened up to God yet. Pray to the Holy Spirit to show you how to, what doors you haven't let him into, what area and aspects of your life you haven't let him into yet. They get real deep and real spiritual. And like, oh, yes, yes. I know there's parts of my life that I haven't given to God. And I've been trying to keep it a secret from him. And I better open that door and let God come in and clean house. Because God's, God's a spiritual maid. He comes in one door at a time and cleans out little parts of your heart. Is that what we read in scripture? I read that he came in and looked at my heart and said, can't work with this. I got to get a brand new one in there. In fact, I'm going to put my heart in there. There's no room that's going to be dirty and unclean that hasn't been inspected and cleaned perfectly, made new again by God. Bible tells me that God can't be in the presence of sin. Yet the Bible also tells me that God has come and dwelt among men and in their hearts. If my heart is sinful, how can God live there? And me not drop dead. And you not drop dead. Because he's made your heart brand new. It's clean and close. And you're already accepted by God. So you don't need to surrender you don't need to go into this idea of total abandonment because at salvation, all that happened. That all happened. He came in, he moved in, he gave you a new heart. He's made you whole again. It's not a step in your Christian walk. God does it to you and God does it for you. I thought I had a part in this. Well, let's look what 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 says. Verses 23 and 24. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Who's doing the sanctifying? You or him? Him. And I pray, God, your Holy Spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at this. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Who's doing it? He is. What does he want from you and me? To yield our bodies. Lord, have your way with me. Jesus Christ was the perfect example of how to live in total dependency on God. Lord, not my will, but yours be done. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Think not that it's me that does this, but it's the Father in heaven that does this. He had to remind them over and over again. Every time he did a miracle, they wanted to start worshiping him. I didn't do this. My father in heaven did this. He who sent me did this. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. Jesus showed us exactly what a life of total dependency on God does. I can do nothing without God. You and I can do nothing good without God, period. When the flesh gets in the way, when we start yielding to the flesh, we may do what appears good, but because it's done in the flesh, God has nothing to do with it. He's not in that. He's not going to bless it. He's not going to supply his power to make that happen. Why should we yield our bodies? This is a daily attitude of obedience. Now, lucky for us, like I've not been super obedient to God lately. The Bible tells us that 
God has given us an obedient heart. We have obeyed from the heart. Now, what does that mean? It means our heart's perfect. Our heart wants to do what God has called us to do. But God gives you and me a choice every single day. Do we follow the spirit or do we follow the flesh? God wants us to yield to his us, to do good, to produce fruit. Sometimes we make the wrong choice. And he forgives us and he welcomes us back with open arms. We yield so that we can experience God's power over the flesh. Who's strong? Who's the strongest person you know? It's God. So can God make a rock so big he can't lift it? And we can get real philosophical real quick. But who's stronger, God or the flesh? We yield so that we can experience God's power to overcome the flesh. I don't know why this is in there, but I'll read it. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This world has nothing for us. Nothing for us that has any eternal bearing, any eternal satisfaction. Lots of distractions, but that's about it. Look what he is doing to you and me. He's renewing our mind. We'll talk about that in just a little bit, a little bit more. So that we can prove what is a good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Must have missed entering the verse. So I'm going to... 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, body, preserve blameless under the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calls you, who also will do it. Then Colossians 1.13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, translated us into the kingdom of of his dear son. Power of darkness has no more control over you and me. You might feel like things are dark. You may feel that you, as an individual, are recently being attacked. And you might be. You may feel that there's a dark cloud over your family, and there might be. I just heard it this week from some of my pastor friends. It seems like our family has been attacked quite a bit for the last six months. And they went down through a list that would make all of us go, whoa, you guys have been through a ton of stuff. We as a church family have been through a lot of stuff lately. I look back in the last year, a lot of us have experienced a lot of difficult times in our families. Yet. Colossians tells us that we have been delivered from the power of darkness. Satan will use whatever he can to try to bring us down. But we're not tethered to him anymore. We're not chained to him anymore. He's no longer our master. We do not have to listen to him anymore. No longer slaves of sin, but now we are slaves to righteousness. We have a choice who to obey. Now, it makes sense, since God is our Father, that we would obey him. It makes no sense when we listen to old scratch. Don't listen to him. I want you guys to envision a, a picture of a road. There's a field on this side, and there's a field on that side. We were in the realm of darkness, Satan's field. But God took us out of that field and put us into his heavenly kingdom. And the only thing separating us is a road. He's no longer our master. God is our master. We're, we're safe and protected over here. The only thing Satan can do is shout across the road to you. You're nothing. God doesn't love you. You're not forgiven. You're a hypocrite. Look at your life. Look at your performance. We don't have to listen to him anymore. 
He might even not shout. He just might whisper it. Someone on planet Earth says something to you, and then Satan grabs that and uses it. See, told you. Told you you were nobody. Told you you were a total loser, a reject. God doesn't hear your prayers. God's not answering your prayers. God's not working in your life. Satan's a great psychologist. He's been watching human behavior for thousands of years. He's seen one. He's seen them all. He works the system. You're on the right side of the road. You do not have to listen to him anymore. Don't have to listen to his voices. You don't have to listen to the old patterns of flesh that try to rear their, grab your ear. Do not listen to his commands. Do not listen to his whispers. It's all Satan can tell is lies, lies, and more lies. Period. You do not have to obey. The second reason, first, we want to yield our body so that we can have power over this, so we can say, God, in your power, I denounce whatever these voices are. We all have voices. We got people whispering, things whispering in our minds, in our heads. Don't have to listen to them anymore. The second reason we should yield our bodies so that we can live out a righteous life. Not only have power to say no to sin, but also to live out the righteous life, the second half of the gospel. Yes, he saved me, but he also gave me a power within so that I can be like Christ, so that I can live like he lived. Back to our verse. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Don't yield to sin, yield to God. So that tells me it's a choice. It's a choice that you and I have every second of every day. We can either yield to the Holy Spirit or we can yield to the flesh and sin. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Before God can will or act in our bodies, before he can do that, we need to yield our will to his will. Not my will, but thine be done. Now, I want you to understand that you want to do what God wants. That's from a heart perspective. You want what God wants. But God still gives us a will. We can will what God wants. We can will what the old man patterns wants us to do. What Satan wants us to do. The lust of the eyes. The flesh wants us to do. Or we can yield to God. But he can't do that. He can't work in us until we will our will to his. And all of a sudden, we're on the same page. And God says, here we go. Now we're getting somewhere. Now we're going to do some awesome things. Now you're going to see fruit produced in your life. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Well, that was easy for Jesus because... You know, yeah, I understand he was a man, but he was God, too. If I had the mind of Michael Jordan, I could be a wonderful basketball player. If I had the mind of Jesus, sure, I could do that, too. Oops, wait. It says we got the mind of Christ. We want this. It's our desire to yield to him. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Do you realize that? Remember, God is never going to ask you and I to do anything that he hasn't equipped us to do. I wouldn't ask you to fly a jet airplane 
lest I sent you to pilot school and you'd pass with flying colors. Did all the simulators correctly before I put you on an airplane. I'd never ask you to do that. God will never ask you and me to do something that he hasn't already prepared and equipped us to do. Someone once said this truth. He gave himself for us. Agreed? On the cross, he gave himself for us. Why did you do that? So that he might give his life to us. Three days later, he rose again, and we rose with him to newness of life. He died so that we wouldn't have to die. But spiritually, we joined him in that co-crucifixion, that co-death, that co-burial, co-resurrection. The third day, he did that so that he might give us his life, so that he might live his life through us. That's his goal. That's why he did what he did. He gave himself for us that he might give his life to us so that he might live his life through us. Branches that are hanging out in the orchard, if you walk up to them early in the spring when the buds are starting to form and you get real close to them and put your ear down to the buds, you won't hear them grunting, trying to eat. You won't hear them grunting. You guys know why? Because they're just hanging out. The vine that they're connected to is doing all the work. The peaches don't have to think, grow, 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 get juicy, juicy, juicy. They don't have to do it. The apples don't have to do that. They're just hanging out. So it is with you and me. He is the vine. Ye are the branches. You can do nothing without me. You cut a branch off of a tree and lay it on the ground. It's done. It's done. It has to be connected to its source of power. Its source, source of energy. As long as we abide, the vine does the work and we yield to it. Now, I made that a statement that says we have to do something. We have to abide. You have teachers that are going to tell you that you need to abide. You're not abiding in Christ. Abiding simply means to live. Jesus, the Bible uses it in several places where he said, we will come and make our abode with him. We will come and dwell with men. That simply means we're coming to live with men. Where does he live? He lives in our hearts. We are in Christ and he is in us. We live in Jesus. He lives in us. So when did we start to abide in Christ? The moment that you got saved. Now, because he lives in us, we have a responsibility to respond to his living in us, his ability. I'm not suggesting that we just hang out in a life of passivity. We even got statements for that. You've heard people say, just let go and let God. I can't, but he can. Sounds pretty cool. Nor should we go to the up other end of the spectrum and believe that it's all up to us to live a pious life so that we can be a pious Christian. It's all up to me. No, our life should be an exciting adventure of exercising our will in response to his leading. Is he ready to take us places and produce incredible fruit? Absolutely. What does he need us to do? Have an attitude of yielding. Flipping chapter 2, verse 13. Again, responsibility. I like this line. Responsibility is our response to his ability. But I can't, Lord. 
that you can do all things with me, through me. Responsibility is our response to his ability. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, for it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. This is exciting. But God is going or giving us the power to agree with his will. He's even given us the power to agree with his will. We back up one verse in Philippians, go to verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And hopefully some of you uh, haven't broken already your New Year's resolution. I'm going to work out this year. You're already done with that idea. Well, here's the good news about what we're talking about here, about willing. See, it's not we're working to get our salvation. We're not working to make our salvation complete. We're not working to prove that we are saved. What God is simply telling you and me is that I have already, this is past tense, at salvation, put within you everything to live a life of godliness. Second Peter tells us. He didn't leave anything out. He's put it all in you. So what does that mean we need to do? Simply work it out. It's already in. You've been given everything, all spiritual blessings under heaven have been placed in you, and now you just need to work it out. Yield to God. Let him use what you don't even know you may have already. You've been given everything for life and godliness. So God is working in us. Working out what he's already worked in. This word work is the Greek word, Latin word, I'm sorry, for energio, where we get our English word energy. Christ is the power in us to do God's will. You can't do this on your own, you can't do it by the flesh. And it be considered acceptable fruit unto God. Because it's not. It wasn't from him. He had no part in it. Now understand there's good flesh and there's bad flesh. But no matter if it's bad flesh or good flesh, it still produces bad fruit. Remember the tree in the garden. There's a tree, the knowledge of good and evil. And there's a tree of life. We made the mistake. We jumped over on that tree and ate of it. And no matter if it was good or evil, good fruit or evil fruit, good flesh or evil flesh, it's still flesh. God won't accept it. He can't accept it because you didn't do it by his power. God is the energy. He is the thing that is going to work out your salvation. You can't do it by any other means. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 says, Now to him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Wow. We get confined in our little human boxes. Oh, this will never work. God can't do this. God can't heal somebody. God can't. You fill in the blank. Now to him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that, look at this, worketh in us. Worketh in us. It's not exciting. We got a power that is abundant and it's working in you. And you had nothing to do with that. Trust him. Yield to him. Be responsible by yielding to his ability. <laughs> Quote by Dwight L. Moody. Can we get weary? Can we get weary? I'm not tired of the work. I'm tired in the work. Absolutely, as Christians, we can get weary. But we'll never get tired of loving others with the power of Jesus Christ. We will get tired. We'll get on each other's nerves. 
will want to take a Sunday off or a month off or more, but will never grow weary. So when it comes to this will thing, who's making the decisions? Was it God or was it Paul? Was it God or was it you? My answer to that is who cares? It's a beautiful partnership between you and God. You have the mind of Christ. We're one, one in the spirit. We work together. It's a wonderful partnership. Man's will and God's will acting as one. Are you yielding? Yes, I yielded my body at salvation. I gave God my life the moment I trusted him and he moved into my heart. Gave me a new one. Gave me a new spirit. Joined his spirit with mine. Yet today, daily, we need the attitude of obedience to respond to his care and management. No longer underneath the management of scratch, we're now underneath the management and care of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Your emotions may say that you are not, but your will must act on faith that you are. When Adam pulled the plug on God's cord, when did that happen? That happened in the garden. When Adam severed that relationship, he literally went over and yanked that power cord right out of God himself. I don't need you anymore. From that day forward, Adam started running on batteries. Now, some of you out there, you spend the big bucks and you go out and get yourself some Duracell batteries because you want, don't want anything to break down. And the rest of you are like me. You're hitting the local Dollar General buying the cheapest batteries. And if they last a week, you're happy. But you know what? We are the guys, if it's DG batteries or top of the line, copper top Duracell, both of them run down. And oftentimes, we find ourselves run down. Have we been trying to do it on our own power? Have we been trying to live the Christian life by our own strength? Have we been pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps? Ensure you are not on fleshly battery life, but plugged into Christ's life, which never runs out. Christian living is not our living with Christ's help. It's Christ living his life in us. John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. Let's stand and pray this morning.